Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Susan Shand and Anna Mateo. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Susan Shand. U.S.-backed Syrian forces fighting Islamic State militants said they freed more than 12 Yazidi children from IS last month the children were released when the Syrian Democratic Forces evacuated civilians from the town of Baghouz. The children had been held by the militant group for years. Mustafa Bali is a spokesman for the Kurdish-led alliance. He wrote in a social media tweet, Among many children saved from IS territory today, a group of Yazidi children also arrived to safe areas. Yazidis are a Kurdish-speaking religious minority who live mostly in northern Iraq. They are viewed as infidels by IS extremists. In August 2014, IS militants attacked Sinjar in northern Iraq then home to the largest Yazidi community in the world. At least 5,000 Yazidis were killed during the attack, mostly men and boys. IS militants then kidnapped thousands of Yazidi children and women and made them work as child soldiers or sex slaves. The 12 children recently freed in Baghuz are now in a special home near Hasaka, a Kurdish-held area in northeast Syria. I was held for more than four years, said Mazin Salim, 14, a former captive. Along with many other Yazidi children, I was then taken to a location in Syria. I believe it was Aleppo. After staying there for a few months, they moved us to Raqqa, he added. Islamic State made Raqqa its capital. The city was taken from IS by the SDF with support from the U.S.-led coalition in October 2017. The Yazidi teenager said that while he was held, IS brainwashed him with its extremist ideology. In the beginning, they would beat me every day because I didn't know Arabic and didn't know anything about Islam, Salim explained. But slowly, they taught me how to read from the Quran. While it controlled parts of Syria and Iraq, IS forced brainwashed and abused children to carry out suicide attacks, kill civilians, and perform other cruel acts. I checked up on all these children, said Shaheen Hussein, a Kurdish doctor. He has been providing medical care to the Yazidi children since their arrival. All of them have psychological problems. Hussein also said some of the children have been suffering from physical illnesses for a long time without receiving any treatment. Since the battle to capture Baghuz began, SDF fighters have been better able to find Yazidi children and women. Since all civilians are leaving Baghuz, it is easier to identify Yazidis as they come out of the town, SDF spokesman Mustafa Bali told VOA. Yazidi children and women are taken to a location that is separate from refugee camps for the other civilians fleeing IS. Our job is to receive them, give them medical treatment, and then return to Sinjar, said Mahmoud Resho, 
He is part of Yazidi House Council, a local organization that supports Yazidi refugees and captives. So far, we have a total of 25 children and a woman who are waiting to go to their families in Sinjar, Resho told VOA. Resho said the Iraqi government had recently closed its border with Syria. That's why these people have been waiting for a while, he added. The Yazidi children rescued from IS in Syria have other problems as well. Many do not know where their families are now, Resho said. These kids have been kidnapped for almost five years. Some of their families are either killed or have migrated to Europe, he said. Fourteen-year-old Salim says he does not know what he will find when he returns to Sinjar. I miss my family so much, he said, but he does not know whether they are alive or dead. I'm Susan Shand. Indonesia's most populous province has set restrictions on when more than 80 English language songs can be broadcast. The West Java Provincial Broadcast Commission identified 85 songs its members consider adult because of their offensive language. It said, that local radio and television stations can only play such music between 10 at night and 3 in the morning. The songs include Ed Sheeran's Shape of You, Ariana Grande's Love Me Harder, and That's What I Like by Bruno Mars. Indonesia is the world's biggest Muslim-majority country. It has seen a rise in restrictions on subjects or behavior considered pornographic. The country is officially secular, meaning there is no state religion. But local lawmakers sometimes pass laws based on Sharia, or Islamic law. Broadcast programs are barred from having songs and or videos that show or contain obscenities, sex, and drugs, said Nening Atiatol Faizia, a member of the commission. She said the action followed public comments on the issue. There were similar objections over thousands of songs, she said. Faizia added that she and other members were also making a list of Indonesian language songs they considered adult. West Java is home to 48 million people. It is known for being among the most conservative provinces in Indonesia. At the national level, Indonesia already has strong anti-pornographic laws. Critics say these measures can be misused to threaten tolerance or creative expression in the Southeast Asian country. Last month, Indonesia's parliament dropped a music bill after protest by artists and rights activists who were concerned that it could restrict freedom of expression. The bill included wording that aimed to prevent the creation of music considered to include bad influences from foreign cultures. The Jakarta Post newspaper said it also was designed to control influences that could incite violence or illegal behaviors.
From VOA Learning English, this is the Health and Lifestyle Report. The brain, like any other body part, gets old. However, not all brains age the same way. For example, women's brains may age more slowly than men's. That is the finding of a U.S. study from Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. Researchers there wanted to find out how the brain uses sugar. To do that, they studied just over 200 brains of men and women aged 20 to 80. They used PET scans to look at the flow of oxygen and sugar in the brains. The researchers found that the brains of women looked nearly four years younger than the brains of men who were born in the same year. Their findings suggest that the brains of men and women may use sugar differently as they age. But the researchers do not know why. Some scientists suggest that hormones could play a part. The lead author of the study, Manu Goyal, is an assistant professor of neurology and of neuroscience. In a statement published on the website Science Daily, Goyle explained why the work is important. How the brain uses fuel, he wrote, might help us understand some of the differences we see between men and women as they age. On its website, the National Institute on Aging describes an aging brain. Parts of the brain get smaller, especially those important to learning and other complex mental activities. Communication between neurons may decrease. Blood flow may lessen and inflammation may increase. All these changes slow our cognitive abilities. We have trouble remembering things, finishing complex tasks, or paying attention. Given what scientists already know about aging, the recent study about sex differences in the brain has raised some questions. For one, if women's brains age more slowly than men's, why do more women get Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's disease is a progressive brain disorder that cannot be stopped. It slowly destroys memory, thinking skills, and eventually the ability to carry out the simplest of tasks. Alzheimer's does not have a cure. However, doctors say that between 50 to 60% of Alzheimer's cases can be prevented by simple lifestyle changes. Whether you are a man or a woman, here are some things you can do to keep your brain young and healthy. Sleep is the easiest and best thing you can do to keep your brain young. Experts say to try to get around seven hours of sleep each night. Get aerobic exercise for 30 to 40 minutes, three to four times a week. Exercise helps you grow brain cells and improves blood flow in the brain. Eat a healthy diet. Doctors say any diet that is good for the heart is also good for the brain. One example is the Mediterranean diet, with lots of vegetables, especially leafy greens, fruits, especially blueberries, nuts, whole grains, red wine, in moderation, and fish. Do activities that make you excited and happy. Spend time with family and friends. The researchers of the brain study published their findings in February in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Goyle and his team 
plan to continue researching this topic. Currently, they are following a group of adults to see if people with younger-looking brains are less likely to develop problems with their thinking over time. And that's the Health and Lifestyle Report. I'm Ana Mateo. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. In the spring of 1865, the American Civil War was over, and the president who had led the Union during that war was dead. Abraham Lincoln had been murdered before the final surrender of Confederate forces. Now, the reunited nation had a new president, Andrew Johnson. He had been Lincoln's vice president. The Chief Justice of the United States swore Johnson into office a few hours after Lincoln's death. Most of Lincoln's cabinet was there, together with leading members of Congress. They looked to the new president with a mixture of shock and hope. Shep O'Neill and Tony Riggs begin the story of America's 17th president. Andrew Johnson was, like Abraham Lincoln, a man of the people. He was born in North Carolina. His family was poor. There was no money or time for young Andrew to go to school. When he was 14 years old, his mother sent him to work for a tailor to learn to make clothes. Andrew worked hard. He opened his own tailoring business in the eastern part of the state of Tennessee. When he was 18, he married. His wife, Eliza, taught him to read and write. Andrew became active in politics. At the age of 21, he was elected to the town council. Two years later, he became mayor of the town. At 35, he won a seat in Congress in Washington. Next, he became governor of Tennessee. Then the state made him one of its two senators. The poor tailor boy was a success. Andrew Johnson was a member of the Democratic Party. In the presidential election of 1860, he supported his party's candidate, not the candidate of the Republican Party, Abraham Lincoln. But Lincoln won the election, and, as a result, southern states carried out their earlier threat. They began leaving the Union to form their own nation. Johnson opposed this secession. He believed the South should remain part of the United States. He decided he had no choice but to support the Republican president. Most of the other citizens in Tennessee disagreed with him. They decided to leave the Union. Andrew Johnson had to flee his home to save his life. He returned only after Union forces took control of Tennessee and made him military governor. President Lincoln noticed the man from Tennessee who supported the Union over the opposition of others. In 1864, Lincoln decided to run for re-election. He chose Johnson to be his vice presidential candidate. Lincoln hoped Johnson would win the support of Union-loving Democrats. He hoped Johnson would help heal the wounds between North and South. 
Now, Lincoln was dead, and Johnson was president. It was up to this little-known former tailor to make the decisions on reconstruction, on rebuilding the Union. Johnson, not Lincoln, would decide if Reconstruction would be easy or hard. Johnson would choose if the North would punish the defeated rebel states or be merciful to them. The radicals of Lincoln's Republican Party wanted severe Reconstruction. They said the South was a defeated enemy. They demanded strong punishment for all Southerners who took part in the rebellion. These radicals had disliked Lincoln's plans for Reconstruction. They felt he was too weak. Now they hoped Johnson would share their ideas. They urged him to call a special session of Congress to pass strong legislation against the South. The radicals had reason to believe the new president agreed with them. He had called the rebels traitors. He had demanded strong action against them when the war ended. The time has come, Johnson had said, when the American people should understand what crime is and that it should be punished. But Andrew Johnson surprised the radicals. He did not call the special session of Congress. Instead, he announced his own program for the southern states. Johnson declared a pardon for all former Confederates who promised to support the Union and obey laws against slavery. Then he permitted former officials of the Confederacy to run for office in their state's new elections. Many of these former rebels were elected. The radical Republicans were angry. They saw these elections as proof that the South had not really changed. They accused Johnson of being too soft. They urged him to punish the rebels. One radical newspaper wrote, There is only one sure and safe policy for the immediate future. The North must remain the dictator of the Republic until the spirit of the North shall become the spirit of the whole country. The South's treason is still unpunished. Southerners cannot be trusted. The radicals also worried about what would happen to the recently freed slaves. They said the new state governments of the South would not treat blacks as free and equal citizens. As proof, they pointed to new laws the Southern legislatures passed. For example, the state legislature in Mississippi said no black person could rent farmland. It said a black person needed special permission to work at any job except farming. Mississippi also passed a law saying a black person could be forced to work for a white man, usually his former owner, if he had no other job. Another way the state governments in the South acted against blacks was by refusing to give them the right to vote. The radical Republicans decided that President Johnson's Reconstruction program must be stopped. They began working to get control of Congress, to pass their own program. Only by gaining political power could they punish the South and guarantee full political rights to former slaves. 
the radicals tried to take control in two ways. First, they refused to let many of the recently elected Southern congressmen take their seats when Congress opened. Then they formed their own joint committee on Reconstruction. This committee, not the Senate or the House of Representatives, would make many of the decisions about Reconstruction. Radical lawmakers took other steps to seize control of Reconstruction efforts in the South. Congress had established a government agency to take care of black refugees in the South. The agency gave food and clothing to former slaves who had no food, money, or jobs. It began to teach them to read and write. Republicans in Congress moved to extend the life of the agency and increase its powers. They passed a bill and sent it to the White House for the President's approval. President Johnson vetoed the bill. He said it would create false hopes among former slaves. He also said it was unconstitutional. The radicals tried to overturn Johnson's veto. However, they failed to get the necessary votes. Congress passed several other bills giving the federal government power to protect the rights of blacks in the southern states. President Johnson vetoed these bills, too. He said they interfered with the rights of the states. These defeats made the radicals even more angry. Their newspapers began a steady attack against the president and his policy toward the South. Some even accused him of treason. Many Americans agreed with this criticism of President Johnson. They gave the radicals a big victory in congressional elections of 1866. Radical leaders gained the power to pass any bill they wished, even over the president's veto. And they wasted no time doing just that. Time after time, they voted to overturn Andrew Johnson's vetoes. The atmosphere in Washington became very tense. Relations between Congress and the White House sank to their lowest level in history. The political skies darkened. Soon, the storm broke. The radicals tried something that had never been tried before. They tried to remove the president from office. The conflict between the radicals and Andrew Johnson would provide some of the most historic and intense moments in American history. That will be our story in the next program of The Making of a Nation. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.